Hello, everyone. Welcome once again to our weekly webinar series. I think we're on edition 23 today, so we really appreciate your loyalty. Uh, we're still talking about successful st strategies for shaping your future. I'm Bryn Darden, the CEO with URSA, and today's session and event is sponsored as usual by Club Solutions, Rex Executive Roundtables, and URSA collaboratively. Today, specifically, we're talking about making exercise essential. We've got some great panelists, and the session today is sponsored by MXM. Joining us uh, once again, as they have every single week, we've got uh, Blair McCainy. Uh, Blair is the CEO of MXM and the owner of the works of Wenanchi. Bill McBride. Bill is the co-founder, president, and CEO of Active Wellness. And joining us as special guest this week, a uh, longtime friend, former employee at URSA for many years, Amy Bantham. And Amy is a CEO and also the founder of Move to Live More, which I want to hear a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, and then we also have uh, Dr. Bob Salas. And Dr. Bob Salas is the co-director of Sports Medicine Fellowship Program. And he's also Kaiser Permanente and clinical professor of family medicine. He's been very active in uh, sort of the wellness, uh, well-being arena, um, sharing his quotes and his thoughts to help us change the public perception around uh, exercise for a, in a positive way. So without further ado, Amy, could you tell the audience a little bit more about sort of what you're doing and what your organization's all about and uh, why you're so passionate about this topic? Great. Thanks so much, Brent. I'm very happy to be here today with Blair, Bill, and Bob to talk about exercise is essential, which is such an important topic. As you mentioned, I'm the CEO and founder of Move to Live More with a mission to help people live healthier, longer, more active lives. We address chronic disease, physical inactivity, and obesity through innovation and cross-sector collaboration. And the three sectors that we're working to bring together our healthcare, health and fitness, and communities. Now, as you mentioned, I was with URSA for a number of years. I've actually been in the health and fitness industry for 25 years as personal trainer, group exercise instructor, health coach, and of course at URSA. I am a doctor of public health. My doctoral field work and research focused on two areas. One was on integrating healthcare and communities by addressing non-medical determinants of health. And the other, which I think is most relevant to our discussion today, was um, assessing an exercise referral network. So looking at physicians prescribing and referring exercise and interviewing and, and surveying physicians and exercise professionals and really trying to understand the integration of healthcare and health and fitness. Yeah, great. That's exactly why you're on the call. You're one of the experts out there. We can certainly tell that. Uh, and Dr. Salas, uh, can you give the audience just a little sort of briefing on what you're spending your time uh, doing these days for the most part? Well, I'm a family medicine and sports medicine physician in Southern California. Um, I've uh, been a big proponent of trying to connect fitness with healthcare. I was president of the American College of Sports Medicine you know, about uh, 10, 10, 12 years ago and started an initiative called Exercise as Medicine and really just trying to get physicians to think of exercise as their first line prescription was able to get what we call an exercise vital sign instituted at Kaiser Permanente where all of our patients are asked uh, during visits um, you know about their exercise habits how many days a week are they doing at least moderate exercise how many minutes we call it an exercise vital sign and we just encourage our physicians and other providers it, it, it's it, it's regardless of specialty you get asked those patients get asked those questions and we encourage our physicians just to make a very quick exercise prescription you know just to, you know are you, I'd like you to walk 30 minutes, five days a week before I put you on a medicine for your blood pressure, or your diabetes, or what have you. So, so uh, we've been working on that, and, and I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how can we leverage physical activity to help our patients. And we have a big NIH-funded study looking at our diabetic patients to start with an exercise prescription. We're actually putting accelerometers on them to see if we can influence their exercise habits in the clinical setting. 
And so I feel very passionate about the role of health clubs in connecting with healthcare organizations uh, to make clubs more about health and, and less about the club portion of it. I think that's what we really need. So I, I spend a lot of my time working on that. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I don't know if you're aware, but I w was um, the vice president to Cooper Aerobics Center and worked with Dr. Kenneth Cooper uh, very closely, a name I'm sure you're familiar with. And, you know, three decades ago, he was preaching this same sermon about physicians need to be recommending their patients to exercise. And the outcome of that dramatically improved uh, the actuality of people following their doctor's advice about exercise. So it's not really anything new, but it's something we just haven't made much progress on. Would you agree? Exactly. Actually, actually uh, Steve Blair, who, who did most of the research there in the aerobic center longitudinal study at the Cooper Clinic, uh, it is really inspired this whole exercise as medicine initiative with his research that was just so powerful and so clearly showed that this should be the first line prescription and we just need to get healthcare providers around the world to sort of institute that message which so clearly the evidence points to we should be doing. Right. So uh, Bill and Blair, you know, I mean, this is a topic that really has been disheartening for all of us that have run health clubs and we're in the health and fitness business because the way the the way that we're being portrayed in the public eye is just demeaning and disheartening. Yeah. I, I, I So um, a couple of things on that. And, uh, um, you know, the name of our clubs is WORKS, W-O-R-X, which stands for Workout Prescription. And I think for too long we have marketed the idea of health and wellness without ever actually being deliberate about the process. Right. So we, 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 we say one thing and then and oftentimes in this business, you're, it's, just, it's a sales organization and processes are put in place maybe just to sell product, but not, but not necessarily a really deliberately about that, about the customer and really what they're trying to accomplish. And now we see more and more that clubs are trying to create these onboarding pathways. I just wonder how many of us have engaged maybe with physicians to help design the onboarding pathway to, and have it be something that there'd be more confidence in. But I do think that our industry as a whole is, is, is suffering because of that, right? We've been, you know, we've been really good at uh, sales and not so good as um, Dr. Salas said at the health side of, of the health club piece. We've sold the club, but haven't executed on the health piece. Sure. Right. Well, there's there's several, Brent, can I say a few words? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there's several issues here. Um, my, you know, my company's Active Wellness, and we're owned 48% by Providence St. Joseph Healthcare, uh, one of the top uh, largest healthcare systems in the country. And um, Bob, I've done work with ACSM. I'm an editor for the fifth edition of the Facility Standards Guidelines. I've done work with ACE. Um, you know, I believe in this, but we've got several problems with our industry with regard to this topic. Um, you know, last report I saw 40% of doctors or primary care docs are obese. Um, when I take over a medical wellness center and I put the employees from the healthcare systems onto my benefits package, their costs immediately go down because a lot of the hospital employees are um, have conditions, chronic conditions that uh, negatively affect the benefit structure. Um, so we have a, a system where the medical community itself um, probably isn't where we would hope it to be, except for those that are on the forefront, like Dr. Cooper, like Dr. Silas, you know, that are exercises medicine and proactive. But there's still a lot in that community that aren't living the lifestyle um, of what we offer with regard to activity. So you've got that internal barrier, and then you've got what Blair and I have talked about in the past. We've done everything we can to fight regulation and legislation in our industry. Um, and now I think we suffer from that because we now don't have credibility. Um, you know, you guys aren't regulated. You don't want to be licensed in any way, shape, or form. You don't want anybody messing with you. We don't trust you. And so um, I think that we have to take care of our own house with regard to holding ourselves to a higher standard. Um, and then we got to keep fighting the fight with educating, um, you know, the medical practitioners and the medical community on the benefits of exercise and, and have that be, you know, our role um, versus waiting for them to just uh, ask us if we can fill a need. Right. Yeah. So, Amy, I mean, this is 
part of the conundrum, right? We, we're not getting the public portrayal, if you will, that we want. How do we change that message? You know, what do you see as the path toward that? Yeah, I mean, it's inconceivable to our community, our, our our audience, our internal audience, that we could be lumped in with casinos and bars and restaurants, and yet we are. And so we need to make it inconceivable to policymakers and the public. And we need to do that by talking about how physical activity is essential, how health and fitness centers are essential, a community-based solution, and that the health and fitness industry is part of the solution, and a long list of reasons why it improves length of life, quality of life. It's a really important risk mitigation strategy when it comes to COVID. Mm -hmm. There has been tremendous evidence coming out. I, I do a weekly blog series on uh, COVID and physical activity. And what's not surprising is that physical activity has dropped since COVID lockdowns. Of course, when you close the places where people go to be physically active, like health and fitness centers, parks, recreation centers, physical activity levels drop. What is more surprising to me is the evidence that has come out about obesity and physical inactivity as risk for severe illness from COVID. And I think that needs to be a really important part of the messaging strategy from the health and fitness industry. A time of COVID is about assessing risk. We assess risk when we go to the grocery store. We assess risk when we decide whether our kids to school. And so, Clubs are mitigating risks by, through air ventilation, through cleaning and disinfection, they're communicating this mitigated risk to people, but there also needs to be a proactive message about how you are mitigating your risk, members, consumers, public, of, of severe illness from COVID by being physically active. So right. I think that's, so mess messaging is critical. So, Dr. Salas, uh, you know, to that end, why are we not getting that message out there, not, not just from health club operators, but why is the media and the medical community not talking more about these risk factors of obesity and inactivity and how that makes you much more likely to contract COVID as well as other diseases? Why is that just not, not something that's being said? Yeah, you know, I wish I had the answer to that. That's been one of the biggest frustrations of mine because to me, this pandemic has simply exposed how unhealthy we are as a country, really how unhealthy we are around the world, but the United States in particular. Clearly, the severity of our pandemic in the United States has been exactly related to the unhealthy lifestyles that, that Americans lead. And it frustrates me that the messaging around it is all about staying in your house and waiting for a vaccine. But you know, that's the kind of message that we've propagated for virtually every chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, whether it's high blood pressure. We tend to talk about make sure you're on these medicines instead of why don't you take control of your health by getting out and being physically active, by eating right and managing your chronic conditions with lifestyle instead of pills. It's always go hide in the house and wait for a medication. And that's simply what we're doing now. Everybody's hiding in their house, waiting for big pharma to save us because we've been taught that the healthcare really only has to offer medications, pills or procedures. That's what we do. And that's a frustration of mine since the day I started practicing medicine is why isn't there a focus more on preventing these things with lifestyle, treating these diseases with lifestyle. And you know, I've, I've worked the last 12, 14 years with the Claremont Club in Southern California, and I've just been astounded what we've been able to do with just some really serious chronic diseases. We've taken some of the sickest patients, and we've been able to show uh, that we can use the environment of a health club and the, in, in the treatments that can be administered there in terms of physical activity. It's been astounding. And, and Mike Alpert's leadership there, it, it's just been amazing. We've taken spinal cord patients. We've taken women with breast cancer. We've taken kids with cancer, those with cardiovascular disease, on and on and on, and it's astounding. And we've been able to study some of the effects we've had with these programs. 
sadly, the Claremont Club is probably going to have to close because they've not been allowed to open. We are so strict here in California, particularly L.A. County, where they're located. I j it's just astounded me that all 110 spinal cord patients who had dramatically improved their condition, reduced things like complications like urinary tract infections. We've been able to show that. Oh. We're Blah. dramatically improved by coming in and working out three days a week. That resource is wiped out because of these restrictions, and I just don't get it. Yeah. So if that's not considered an essential business, I don't know what is. Thank Fred, you. How can, can, I can add, we, how, can I yeah, how can we clone you first? That's the first question. <laughs> how can we clone you and have some more physicians uh, get on board with this whole move? <laughs> Uh, and before you jump on, Amy, I just, yeah, it's interesting to hear well, you say. Well, I think there are, a lot more, there are a lot more out there than you think, yeah. Go Your ahead. audio is going in and out on us just a little bit, Dr. Salas. So I'm going to go to okay. Amy and uh, we'll see if it comes back. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I agree okay. with Bob 100%. And I just wanted to add one point about sitting at home and waiting for a vaccine, which has absolutely been the messaging. There's a lot of very interesting research around vaccines not being as effective and not generating the appropriate immune response in people living with obesity. So sitting at home and waiting for a vaccine might not be the salvation that we hope for people living with obesity, which again is additional support for the message on the part of the health and fitness industry that we need to help people protect themselves and health and fitness and physical activity can be part of their own personal protective equipment, if you will, for, um, for COVID. Right. Brent, you know, so I, I love hearing, I, th this is what we all have wanted to hear, you know, right. shouted from the mountaintops and have the media pay attention to it and, uh, and we've not we've not gotten that and recently. I mean, we're starting to see a little bit the NPR piece the other day, and and maybe some more coming out Washington Post possibly, and a few other areas. And then on top of that, anecdotally, if those of us and, and you guys know we're still closed up here. Uh, just be just over six months now in my in my own clubs, and the other clubs in this county, we share a lot of information. And just anecdotally, the emails that I get from members that that both Amy and Bob are describing, saying, please let me in, you know, um, talking to another club operator who has a, uh, got received an email uh, forwarded to him. This patient is that this member is in a wheelchair and does, uh, you know, it, it can get out of the wheelchair and be in the water and get some great exercise in the water. Now they've been closed for six months as well. And he had received a, uh, an email from his doctor saying, you know, you are about two weeks away from being bedridden the rest of your life because you, you've not been able to exercise. And we're, and I just, those stories out there, just anecdotally of what we're hearing, you know, as club operators, just really put the exc exclamation point on this whole thing for me. And it's just, it just burns me. I, I, am, I, I am hearing this though from uh, in our state about essential. They're trying to get away from that word. They're trying to get away from, from labeling different businesses in certain ways here. And so they, they're all, the policymakers here are saying, eh, we kind of wish we wouldn't have said that because now yeah. we've drawn a bright line that we have to describe as something being or not being. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, we're, we're kind of preaching to the choir, of course, all of our listeners, they're health and fitness professionals. And so they're really uh, encouraged. I'm seeing quite a few comments coming in you know, one of the questions is what can people really do to create this sort of motivation for people to, you know, get back to physical activity, even if it's not in the clubs, but certainly within the clubs as well. Uh, how might we help them help their members and their communities get more active and uh, improve their health overall? Dr. South, you want to take that one first? Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think you know, we, you've got to work, you've got to figure out how do we do it safely. That that obviously is going to be the key. And I kind of, kind of tend to go back to sort of the Costco, comparing it to that. If we can open Costco, my God, there's a lot of industries that ought to be open when you start to compare. Yeah. Um, it's becoming really clear that COVID is spread by droplets. 
and the tra chances of transmission from touching something um, are very remote. And, and it seems like the vast majority of the cases are by larger droplets that are generally spread by coughing. And, uh, and certainly it's very easy to mitigate the surface transmission by cleaning surfaces appropriately. There is no need to wear gloves. That almost makes it worse because you just need to wash your hands. You don't need to and not touch your face. Your hands are like gloves. You're not gonna get it through your skin. The key is if you're in a gym setting that you use hand sanitizer frequently, that you wear a mask to prevent those droplets spreading if you are within six feet of somebody. If there's no one within six feet of you, the chances of you inhaling that droplet dramatically increases. Typically, they're gonna to fall to the floor. And so there are clear ways to do this in any kind of outdoor activities. The risk of transmission is virtually zero. So what's really, I think, bothered the people in general is the, the irrationality of what's open and what's closed. You know, How do we justify closing a swimming pool, a tennis court, uh, a running track, hiking trails? So that was just absolutely insane that we were you know, forced to, subjected to avoid all of these things where the transmission risk is virtually zero. So I, I think it's incumbent on you guys to show in the health club industries that you can, like Costco, space people, ask them to wear a mask if they're gonna be in, six, in, in close contact within six feet. And really what you're looking at, a high risk contact, being within six feet of somebody longer than 15 minutes without a mask. That is what should be avoided if that person happened to be positive. And so you can get around that by you either test everybody that comes in and we're, I think, pretty soon going to come out with these very rapid point of care tests where we ought to be able to, within 10 to 15 minutes or less, get a, a, a good indication of whether or not they're positive or negative. And that could really be a boon to helping you guys get open. But in the meantime, it makes no sense, you know, with temperature checks, symptom checks, and then spacing, mask wearing, trying to move as much as you can outdoors, this can easily be done safely. And again, and I get back to the, if Costco can do what they do and be allowed to stay open, certainly the health club industry, if they reach that level of safety, why could they not open as well? And, and I just think that message needs to be heard loud and clear. No doubt. And Amy, you've dedicated uh, most of your entire career pre-COVID and certainly now to trying to get this message heard. What, what would you say to the audience about what can the individual club operators and people out in the community do? Do we just need to keep repeating the same mantra over and over as often as we can or what? Yeah, I think language is really important and it sounds silly, but the fact that we're talking about health and fitness centers as opposed to gyms, I think is really important health and fitness we're about health and constantly hammering home that connection between because there's there's an, a heightened awareness of health right now people are thinking about health in ways that we're all thinking about health because that's what we do all day every day but others aren't and there's a heightened awareness of this connection between infectious and chronic disease between physical activity and mental and physical health. There are a lot of studies coming through, not only showing decreased physical activity levels, but that association with depression, stress, anxiety. We're all living in a very isolated world. So those are the messaging points that I would put around um, messaging to the public. To policymakers, it's about getting clubs open and having them stay open. And as Bob so rightly pointed out, the evidence is really evolving about, uh, and the science is evolving about this novel coronavirus. And we, you know, club operators began by constantly cleaning and sanitizing dis and disinfecting services. And now there's so much more attention on ventilation and so i think a big piece of it is demonstrating to policymakers that health and fitness centers are not these hot spots i think blair's uh, virus to visit ratio is important because really the gold standard of contact tracing is being able to identify where and how and our outbreaks started and so if health and fitness centers are able to show it's restaurants and bars, but it actually isn't health and fitness centers. That is of value to public health departments that are 
um, constantly trying to, to trace origins in order to protect their communities. So if we're messaging and saying we can be part of a solution to, to public health and safety, I, I think that's key. I would say to the virus to visit ratio, I think that's yes and. I think there's a much longer term strategy, but I do think that the health and fitness industry um, should, should invest in and think about third party credibility, yep. third party research, evidence-based data, because when policymakers are making decisions about whether to open, stay open, they're, they're looking at articles in the paper, they're looking at studies that come out, and if the health and fitness industry is able to refute those studies with, with data, um, third-party data, I think that's a really important messaging tool. Yeah, yeah so Blair, you, can you just give everybody the, the latest numbers on that visits to virus ratio that you've got? Yeah, so we closed it out on August 7th so that the PR could start on it, but it's 49.4 million check-ins, 1,155 cases of COVID, none of which we can find what were confirmed of being contracted in a club, but more showing that all the risk mitigation that club, clubs are doing is real, right? I mean, somebody says, I worked on Tuesday and I've now tested positive, yet there were no spreads, no spread in the club. So that's 0.0023% occurrence rate against those check-ins. Now, I'll tell you that our entire intent in collecting that data, and I'll also add this on, 85% uh, of that data uh, was provided by companies that have to answer to accredited investors. In other words, they have you know, risk management in place. And when I say risk management, I'm, I'm not talking about all the risk mitigation that you do because of COVID. I'm talking about before that, you have to be able to explain risk to investors. And they took this very, very seriously. So the data is tight. What we wanted, what we're hoping for, is for somebody to ask the damn question, why? Why is it that? And to get a university, to get somebody to say, we should be looking at that because it's not occurring in clubs. We've uncovered data from certain states. Colorado's is the most front and center, 627. I have updated this, by the way. 627 outbreaks in Colorado as of uh, September, I think it was September 2nd when they last updated their spreadsheet. You know, 260 something of them in healthcare, 40 or so in restaurants, more in bars, grocery, not one, not one in a fitness center, not one. And they're tracking it meticulously there. You can access their spreadsheet. You can just see it. They name the business, how many positive cases. Fitness has been open since June 15th there. What, what we're trying to do with this data is to wait, have somebody wake up and ask the freaking question, why is that happening? Well, we have members, not customers. We can communicate to them. They have to check in. They can sign a new pledge. We know where you're going to be and which way you're going to be facing when you're in our club. We can spread stuff out. We have the best contact tracing. RHVAC is engineered about five times more than retail because of the nature of occupancy and they assume you're gonna have 100% occupancy and everybody working at 80% heart rate. Every, every single thing that somebody from the DOH would say, well, look, if a business could control for all these things, right. we're the only damn business that can control for all those things. Right. And so people have to start asking, why are there none? And that's why because we are designed this way. Blair, you just Blair, a little I, on the edge probably you're not you're, open I, yet. I think, <laughs> I think probably what you're seeing in large part is people who go to clubs are healthier and that's why yeah. they're not getting it. It protects them from the virus. And I would love to look at the data in terms of infection rates among health club members versus infection rates in the yeah. general population. And I would bet anything that they're astronomically higher in the general population. And again, that goes back to the whole point being the way to protect yourself from this virus is to get healthy. That's right. And people don't go work out when they're not feeling well either. And I certainly understand that there's people that are asymptomatic, but we already have a big pre-filter on that one, right? People are still going to go to the grocery store. They're going to go do other activities, but I'm not going to decide to work out if I feel crappy. Yeah, Brent, I might be a little on edge. Maybe, maybe our first step is to get this information in front of the CEO of URSA. And then what he? <laughs> yeah, good one. Wish I knew that guy. 
So, Bob, I, I thought it was really interesting, um, a parallel you made earlier, and I've got a few comments in the chat box about it, about, you know, there's this sort of political, I don't know if it's being politically correct, but we really haven't called people out on the fact that related to diabetes and obesity and physical inactivity that people have to take personal responsibility, right? Uh, they've got to take responsibility for those things, and that in some ways crosses over into a infectious disease. In other ways, they're quite different. Can you just speak to that for the audience? Yeah, you know, if you look at, first of all, the, the biggest risk factor is age. And if you take out the deaths in nursing homes, the death rates from COVID are really low. And if, if you're not living in a nursing home, your chances of contracting it and dying from it are, are really low. And if you look at people who've died from COVID, I've seen data as much as 96% of them suffer from a chronic disease. And so it's just very rare for somebody who's active, healthy, within a reasonable weight to, to die from this. And I just wish that message that there are things that you can do if you're not in that category, if you have chronic diseases and you're not managing them, there are things you can do. You shouldn't be sitting in the house waiting for the vaccine you should be getting out and exercising eating right changing your your weight uh, you know controlling your diabetes your blood pressure on and on and on that's what needs to be the message not just sit at home waiting for the vaccine and uh, i just think that i i just haven't heard that and when you control for these chronic diseases and, and i and i've really been disheartened by the messaging to minority populations african-american latino that you're at so much greater risk because study after study keeps showing if you control for chronic disease for bmi for socioeconomic status your race your gender doesn't seem to matter your blood type on and on and on we're scaring people with these messages instead of coming back to the same fundamental that's, that's underlie, uh, underlies every chronic disease, you need to take care of yourself. The best way to mitigate the effects of every chronic disease, including COVID, is to get yourself healthy. And I wish that we would go back to the personal responsibility piece. There are things that each person can do, and I just don't hear that message being said, not nearly loud enough. Yeah, and just for those of you that are listening, if you're wanting some of these data points, including uh, the research that Blair and MXM have done about visits to virus ratios uh, and some of the other letters and studies that are featured, you can go to ursa.org and there's a, I believe there's a link there about COVID where you can access this and perhaps include it in some of your messaging points to your members on your website and in your community. Yeah, if you're not using the new infographics that Ursa just put out along these lines, you really need to get them and get them out on your social media and start using it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, isn't that a point, Bill? I know uh, Active has been very great about that as well. But to get the message, we need it to be broader and louder. And so the clubs really need to continue sharing these infographics and this information, not just inside their clubs, but in their media networks as well. Yeah, I, I think that's right. You know, there's something that is resonating from hearing, you know, everybody on the panel, Brent. Um, anybody old enough to remember uh, Ron uh, Papil, uh, Ronco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so the rotisserie chicken and the chop matic right? Set it and forget it. Wait, there's more. Um, if he were selling the VCR, the VCR would have had a much bigger adoption rate more quickly, right? There have been buttons on it, you know, and all this is from, from reading books and so forth. My, my point is, is that we hit fitness in a manner that can be intimidating for people. You know, Dr. Stiles will tell us the medicinal amount of fitness needed for medicinal benefit is really small. Right. Um, and, and the efficacy of fitness it doesn't take a whole lot of activity and, and nutrition adjustment to get dramatic impact on chronic disease or, or metabolic syndrome or, or diabetes or any of these things. So we've got people that are the 20, the 10 percent that are passionate about the lifestyle, exercise, training, working out, trying to sell to 90 percent of the population that is confused, intimidated and afraid. And, and so I bring up the Ron Fulfill thing is because he made it simple. Set it and forget it. You know, anybody can use the rotisserie for perfect chicken. Anybody can use the chop matic 
He made it simple to understand. And so we have a, a exercise, exercise physiology story to a population that needs a chop a mat, you know, move more, eat better, have somebody mentally support you. And, and so I think that there's a big part of this in storytelling. And, and I do think URSA can play a role in that as well as all the other trades and, and research groups and manufacturers like Kaiser and so on that, um, you know, walk more, get support from a fitness professional. Let's not underestimate the power and benefit of weight training and the importance of that with regard to musculature, core balance, fall prevention, and so on and so on. I think we, we sometimes overcomplicate our messaging and are definitely overcomplicate our advertising. Um, and so when we're talking about this from a health promotion standpoint, we've got to change the way we tell the story of one step at a time. I watched a movie last night called um, Brittany Runs a Marathon. Has anybody heard of this movie? Um, I think I saw it on Amazon, but um, one step at a time, it has everything in it. Doctor referral for somebody with high BMI, stereotype of gyms, a woman on a journey that gets interrupted by peers, sabotage, lifestyle, peer influence, gets an injury um, and, and works through this journey of running a marathon and losing dramatic amount of weight. Great movie for somebody's personal responsibility and journey and all the obstacles that society puts in their way. Brittany runs a marathon. Great movie for this topic. Anyway, I'll leave it at that, but I think we need to change the way we tell our story. Yes. Well, well, Bill, I would echo that in, in that, let's face it, most of my patients who belong to gyms, I'm not worried about. But unfortunately, the percent of the population that belongs to a gym is small and it hasn't changed much in the last 20 years. Why is that? Why can't we change that messaging? I tell you, it works at the Claremont Club. We got a whole new population in there from spinal cord patients to patients with cancer to kids with cancer, on and on and on, and it absolutely worked. So if you build it and provide the right outreach and marketing, patients will come. And, and I think the way to get at this is not going out and trying to get doctors to refer and you know trying to put on, act like a pharma rep going into doctor's office. It's build it and, and market it to the population. Uh, most of, you know, a huge percentage of our population is suffering from these chronic disease, market it as a solution for these chronic diseases. I think that's the way to, to, to make this happen, to expand who goes to health clubs, because we really need to get a distinctly different population in there. Yeah. So Dr. Salas, can you, uh, just before I go to Amy, can you elaborate just a little more on, you know, the details? If somebody said, yeah, I agree, I'd like to do these programs, what's their first step? Where do they reach out to access some of this information or these organizations? Well, I think, you know, Mike has put, Mike Alpert has put a lot of the stuff out there that we did at the Claremont Club. You know, one of the, the coolest and easiest is we, uh, set up a program for patients with Parkinson's disease. There's this incredible data on cycling and Parkinson's and the effect it has on the disease. And uh, so we opened up this spin class to patients with Parkinson's three days a week. And we did it midday when the spin class wasn't being used, the spin studio wasn't being used that much. And we, it had an incredible effect. Three times as strong as levodopa, the medicine that we use for Parkinson's in terms of its improvement of your tremor and, and balance and gait and falls on and on and on. It was, it was astounding. So simple little programs like that that market people with various chronic diseases. The most amazing was our spinal cord program that we had there that just has been a, you know unbelievable effect on spinal cord patients. Uh, but those are little groups that we began to outreach to. These are significantly... Uh, ill patients or, you know, with chronic disease, chronic disability that normally would get nowhere near a health club. Mike really showed that with the right program, we were able to fill a need in the community that just simply does not exist. Right. Okay, Amy, I'm sorry I kept cutting you off there, but... Uh, oh, no, yeah. not at all. Yeah, I wanted to go uh, first to the 80-20, the and we've been talking about this in the industry for a very long time, and it does come down to storytelling. The health and fitness industry can't be about helping the fit get fitter. If it truly wants to be about 
um, reaching the people who need the health club industry the most. And URSA started, started its URSA foundation around this premise, helping health clubs open their doors to people living with chronic disease and disability to reach beyond this 20%. And if we're talking about community and population health now, what a tremendous way for clubs to position themselves as part of the community. Safe, affordable, accessible, inclusive places for the community to become physically active and to mitigate this risk that we're talking about when we're all thinking about risk day in and day out. I did want to talk a little bit about physician exercise referrals because I, I do think clearly trusted providers counseling their patients to be physically active is crit critical and Bob has dedicated much of his career to this. I think it's important for health and fitness centers to be community-based solutions and part of my research um, was around developing a roadmap for health and fitness centers. These are the 10 steps that they can take to become, to build trust with healthcare and to be trusted. So just like trusted providers are talking to their patients about being physically active, they can then refer their patients to a trusted health and fitness center. And health and fitness centers can become those trusted places by um, through collaboration, communication, through um, uh, reporting back on, on patient outcomes by having patients report back on their outcomes. Hey, Dr. Salas, I went to um, active wellness and I and I and I I brought, you know, I feel so much better and I feel so much less stressed. And so those sort of patient testimonials are really critical. So health and fitness centers thinking about how they can connect with healthcare as community-based solutions. So there's a distinct pathway between healthcare and health and fitness, and then a clear report back to physicians. To, so physicians are more likely to send their patients out into these community-based programs and resources. And Bob mentioned an, a number of wonderful programams that, that the Claremont Club has and, and um, all across the world. Into, sorry, Amy, before you get into that, can you just go, uh, you mentioned this list of 10 ways Yep. Would you be willing to share that with the audience? Can we send that out? Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yep. So yep. Club Solutions and our and Rex send out sort of an overview of the highlights of these every week. So if you don't mind, we'll share that with the audience. Yep. Sorry, Absolutely. go ahead. No, I, that, that was it. I, I stopped and I'd love to hear from others around this. I have a question for Amy. Amy, when you say community-based, what will you, if you put some hard edges on that for us, would you? Yeah, so I the exercise referral network that I studied actually was both a, a closed loop and an open loop system. And by that, I mean that their physicians referred to a hospital affiliated health and fitness center and they referred out into the community to community based health right. and fitness center. So like URSA member clubs, for example. And so when I what I found is physicians have a much higher comfort level referring to hospital affiliated health and fitness centers it was 83 percent were com very comfortable or comfortable versus the reverse 38 percent comfortable referring to community-based health and fitness centers so there's a significant trust gap so how do community-based health and fitness centers build that trust build those relationships with physicians so they refer to them Got it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, so, Bill, I know you're big on this topic, and there's someone in the on the chat box asking about, well, haven't uh, consumer buying behaviors changed? And you and I have talked a lot about that. How does the uh, change in buying behaviors relate to this topic? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Blair's mentioned quite a bit on this, on, on cleanliness and sanitation and safety being a core competency. I think the same goes with with what Amy's talking about here with uh, with the physician referral exercise type programs. Um, you've got to be the credible source in your community, and if you do that, you will get more consumers, and because of that change, consumer awareness. But you'll also have a better story and better audience dealing with the medical community to to have them listen to you in a different way. And you know, unfortunately, we're clumped into 
not only bars and casinos, which I like both of those um, establishments, um, but we're clumped in with gyms that are maybe not as high of standard as other health clubs, medical wellness centers, fitness centers, pick your, your category of name that you want to call it. So, you know, uh, uh, Bob's Motel is different from, you know, you know, Four Seasons, right? Or even Sheridan or whatever. So, so we're in this group of gyms that means different things to different people, but most of the people bring it down to the lowest common denominator. So the, the credibility of we're committed to standards, here's what we're doing, telling the story. And, and, and the medical community doesn't want, hey, we're a great health club who re is really clean. They want to know, here's what we do for people with metabolic syndrome. Here's what we do with diabetic patients. Here's our Parkinson's program. Here's our, they want to know we have protocols and programs. They're not going to refer into just, hey, Bob's gym because Bob's a good guy and he says it's clean and they got good fitness trainers. So, right. you know, you got to have a little bit more meat on the bones. Yeah. Yeah. No, good, good, good stuff. So, Dr. Salas, uh, uh, you know, once again, we've got about, uh, you know, 15 minutes left. What, I, what's... Should, I should have used Blair's gym, not Bob's gym, because Bob's credible. Um, so, <laughs> Bob is a generic term. Yeah. It, it, it did occur to me early on in this, Bill, when we kept talking about it, casinos, bars, cigars, and health clubs, how do those go together? And I would thought, Bill McBride, that's it. Balance <laughs> life, my balance life. Yeah. So, Dr. Salas, uh, again, on this topic, what's what's a question that I haven't asked you that I probably should ask you so that you can share it with the audience? Uh, I think we've covered a lot of great ground here. Um, <laughs> you know, I just get back to the point of, um, of patients sitting around waiting for a vaccine and and the side effects of that, I think, are going to be more devastating than this virus will ever be. And already we're showing signs. Amy sort of referred to the depression. I, I just saw a study, you know, almost 40 percent of adults meet clinical diagnosis of depression before the, the pandemic. It was maybe around 6 percent of the population. Wow. We've seen worsening of diabetes. We've seen increase in suicides. We've just on and on and on. Uh, patients delaying care for all kinds of chronic conditions. Uh, I, I just really worry the secondary effects of this. You know, it's been mentioned a lot, but we are just now beginning to see it, and we're going to look back. Well, how did we let this happen? And so somehow we've got to put a stop to this craziness and and start. And, and to the fact that that a patient can't go to their gym just doesn't make any sense when when all of this other stuff is going on. The the secondary effects of this, I think, are just going to be devastating, and we're just beginning to see them now. Um, but. Yeah. How, how do we yeah. get this turned around before it's too late? Yeah, to your point, I mean, we, we've we already, we're spiraling in this really bad trend downward with increases in obesity and increases in physical inactivity and what I've been calling yeah. unfulfilled well-being. And a pandemic has just accelerated that fall uh, more than yes. we could have imagined in a very rapid way. So somehow we've got to turn this tide. And uh, Amy, I know you mentioned a little bit about the mental health and Dr. Salas touched on it as well. But uh, aside from the physical aspect, I mean, there are some emotional and mental benefits to exercise as well that shouldn't be overlooked. It's not all about weight loss and, you know, reducing obesity. It's also about maintaining your mental health. Yeah, absolutely. I think highlighting the connection between physical activity and physical health and mental health is critical. Again, heightened awareness around mental health right now when people, many people are suffering anxiety, stress levels through the roof, isolation, it's very real. And I think health and fitness centers can position themselves again, coming back to Bill, as you mentioned, community health and fitness centers create communities. And the socialization aspect is, is absolutely uh, very important. It's why people are, are coming back and, and why perhaps the, the virtual is not a perfect substitute. I also, along the lines of community, I also want to talk about behavior change because Dr. Sal is counseling patients on physical activity in his office is this critical start to the behavior change. And health clubs, he, 
he helps pass the baton to health clubs who and exercise professionals who work with the patients to bring about long-term behavior change and, and they bring into it accountability. Um, and they bring in the socialization aspect. Many of the programs that you mentioned, Bob, have a socialization and social support piece of it. And we all know we're in the behavior change business. We know how hard it is. It is very, very hard to change behavior. Right. And health and fitness centers are a very important piece of that. And our exercise professionals are an important piece of that. And if we lose that piece, how are we going to address this obesity crisis, which is no longer in isolation? We have two pandemics going on right now. We have, as one of my podcast guests said, said far more eloquently than I, we have the chronic disease pandemic fueling our infectious disease pandemic. Yeah, that's well yeah, said. That's, that's a good soundbite right there. Yeah, interesting to back that up, Amy. In the study that we did on our Parkinson's patients, when you compared it to uh, some studies done at the Cleveland Clinic where they had patients come in just riding an exercise bike, they showed about a 30% improvement in the Parkinson's symptoms. Just having them come into a uh, uh, laboratory to ride the bike compared to what the result we got at the Claremont Club, we showed about a 60% improvement. And I would argue that that extra additional 30% had more to do with the socialization that occur occurred in the health club that didn't happen in the laboratory where they rode the bike. And it's interesting at the end of the study, 12, a 12 week study of patients coming in three times a week riding a stationary bike. I don't even think a lot of them realized how much their Parkinson's had improved. What they talked about when we, on our exit interviews was, oh, I made all these new friends and we had a Christmas party and on and on and on. That's what they took away most from this program. Uh, and oh, by the way, my Parkinson's also is a lot better, but that's what they remembered and noted. And so, yes, I, I would agree with the socialization in terms of depression and man anxiety managing those. There's a tre tremendous component of there that we just can't measure in a research study. Yeah, several of you have touched on it in different ways, and Blair specifically talked about it, and then Amy really drove it home. But if I may just say, you know, to the audience, I've been trying to preach for years when I've worked with clubs on a consulting basis about, you know, their retention programs and their outcome based results that they really need to understand we're in the behavior change business. And we might raise our hand and say, we know that but how are you really modifying your onboarding process your introductory process to ask the right questions to talk about behavior change to help them modify their routine and attendance too often we skip all that and we're too concerned about here's the best way to do a squat <laughs> you know here's the best way to do a lunge and we forget all this other piece that really needs to happen first which is you just got to show up first let's figure that out yeah. right um, Blair, I know I'm preaching to the choir on you, but Bill's got his hand raised, so I'll go to him. Yeah, we, we have a program with one of our hospital systems, um, and it's a five-step program. It's you know patient training specific for their condition, health coaching, nutrition counseling, patient education, uh, and then supportive technology. And the physician refers them in, and so this is a, this is a new twist on our, our prep programs that we do in many locations, but this one was very very measured. And over a four month period, we had 215 patient referrals from docs. Um, we had got 73% engagement, which is really, really high, much higher than I would have anticipated. Um, so, you know, we did over 260 sessions with these folks. About half of them, 55% met with dietitians. Anyway, when the four months was over, the overall group that, that engaged lost an average of four pounds. And that might not sound like a lot, but that's 12 pounds a year which tends to be opposite of what people nat naturally gain a year, right? 55% felt mentally and physically more active and on a pathway to ongoing success than they did at the beginning of the four month program. So back to minimal efficacy, right? Structured program, four months, sustained weight loss in a safe manner, mental, physical improvement, um, and so that's the kind of thing we have to do as an industry. We have to measure the outcomes, have a protocol, and, and be able to present that to, to get credibility. But um, resounding success, 
we do this in lots of locations, but that's just the most recent one that I got stats on. Um, so, you know, just, you know, thinking through A to Z and being strategic about your programming. That'd be what I'd like to add. Sorry to butt in and take some of Blair's air time. Blair? <laughs> no, 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 no. You know, I, I feel like too frequently we use, uh, you know, our industry has used the sale of personal training as a proxy to some sort of great practice about, you know, helping somebody get somewhere. And everybody has success stories. I mean, but, you know, those could be people that are just completely self-motivated and happen to be a success story. Did you really have something to do with it? And I've, I've said a lot of times I would contend that frequently the best thing that we can do to, uh, to teach somebody when they come in is how to pack a damn gym bag and where to set it and how to have their clothes out and just sort of the simple things, the shoulder times around the exercise. And, you know, for the first three weeks, you're going to walk the treadmill seven days a week for 10 minutes. Like, I really believe that the, that the frequency, the, you know, the spatial habit before the temporal side of this. And our industry often goes to the temporal side. You know, we've got to get you doing these exercises with the trainer three times a week when maybe the best thing for a lot of people is walk the treadmill every single day. Let's just get you to where you can schedule this, you know, where to put your gym bag, you know, where your clothes have to be afterwards and start that habit with some really easy process because that that's where the habit creation starts is really understanding how to control these small processes and and I, and I think I think I think that's a really big one is just what we call gym bag readiness yeah if I could recommend a book uh, it's called uh, um, no sweat by Michelle Seeger I know many of you have read that uh, before it's really great and talks about people viewing exercise as a gift rather than a chore among other things uh, but it's quite good it's got a lot of research in it and it is all about uh, sort of behavior change and changing this mindset around uh, physical activity so uh, we have just a few minutes left I want to ask Amy and Dr. Salas first um, if there was a sound bite that you'd encourage our listeners to include in their media messaging out to members uh, you know, a sync two or three sentences, what might that be that would be at the top of your list? Dr. Salas, I'll let you go first. I'll put you on the spot first. You're the doctor. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. For me, um, you know, there's a treatment for COVID. There's a vaccine out there. It's called exercise. Exercise is medicine. That's something I've been preaching, you know, my entire career, and it doesn't change with this virus. It's the same treatment. Why do we keep ignoring it and go right to the first pill or procedure? This is what we need to do, not just for COVID, but for every chronic disease. Well said, sir. Well said. Amy? So Bob is a medical doctor and I'm a doctor of public health. So I'm going to second that from okay. a public health perspective. <laughs> um, so the health and fitness industry is about prevention, preventing disease, and we're also about managing disease. And I, I really keep coming back to physical activity as a way to protect ourselves, protect our families, and, and mitigate our risk for severe illness. And, you know, I, people have moved away from this essential because it's a, a loaded term, but Physical activity is critical. Um, health, the health and fitness industry is critical, and we are part of the solution that is going to help see our way out of this pandemic and this crisis, and and prepare us for the next crisis. We need to take advantage of this heightened awareness and this thinking around health. Very good. All right, Bill and Blair, uh, final final thoughts about this topic about making exercise essential. I'll go first. Okay. Right after Blair. No, you go. <laughs> uh, I, th three quick points um, to steal from Brittany Rose Marathon. You know, keep in mind one step at a time. Okay. Um, you know, Claremont Club, ACAC. You know, those are examples out there of clubs that were ahead of their time and do an amazing job. But if we had to really focus on it, don't forget mental wellness, don't forget social energy, and teach one step at a time. Okay. Excellent. All right, Blair. 
Well, it seems to me that we have a we now have possibly a new um, way to talk about the short term. This we may have an opportunity to talk about short term gratification. We've talked a lot about uh, for decades about heart disease, about obesity, and somehow the public hasn't really said, "Okay, I'm an, I'm willing to work out today in order to avoid this ten years down the road." That's been a tough message to sell, but. Um, we know that if you do one bout of moderate exercise, you increase your immunity. It's not like you have to wait till you're in shape to improve immunity. You have to get up and move. Right. Maybe this gives us the opportunity to couple some short-term objectives, mental health, stronger immunity, with the more long-term and create a bridge in there. So I, I think this messaging is going to have to be we're safe and, and we work now. I like the, you know, that we there there is a way to avoid COVID and it's called exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. Uh, I want to just thank all the panelists again for joining us again today. To the audience, the panelists always volunteer their time and they're happy to do it. They want to give back to the industry and try and give you information to help you succeed. I thought we got some great information today uh, from Dr. Salas and Amy, and then there was Bill and Blair that were here too. Uh, but we appreciate uh, them. They've come back every week uh, and they're not paid to be here either. So I really appreciate uh, their helping out. If you need a system, you know, to survey your members, MXM, contact Blair. And Bill, of course, does a lot of consulting through his consulting company, BMC3. If you need a little bit more help on a variety of topics, you know, he does a fabulous job. So just a plug for both of those guys. Amy and Dr. Salas, thank you all again. You're experts. We are preaching to the choir. We're right behind you. We wish y'all were in public office right now uh, <laughs> directing the healthcare system. So uh, to everyone else, we'll see you next week. We'll be back one more time. Uh, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.